Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, um, and all of you who are visiting us um, from around the world online. A very warm welcome to our first session this morning in, the, uh, in this wonderful Conference of the Trees here at the New York Times Climate Hub. Uh, we have what I think is going to be a fantastic session to just uh, kick off our day. It's entitled Passing the Torch, Intergenerational Climate Dialogues. Um, the conversation this morning is going to be led by the New York Times' Lindsay Layton. Um, and on our panel, we have Evelyn Asham, Jerome Foster, Aya Chebi, and President Mary Robinson. Um, we are extremely grateful to Morgan Stanley for supporting this session. And I'm just going to play a short video before the panelists come on. Thank you very much. I'm Audrey Joy. Chief Sustainability Officer at Morgan Stanley and CEO of the Institute for Sustainable Investing. Welcome to the New York Times Climate Hub taking place alongside COP26. The health of our planet is now the existential issue for business leaders and government leaders alike. The important conversations happening here in Glasgow are a critical catalyst for the actions we need to take to stem the long-term effects of climate change. Clearly, the time for action is now. To begin, I'd like to share with you some of our best thinking on one of the topics we're here to discuss. Thank you and enjoy the session. We now find that 85% of individual investors are interested in sustainable investing. Among millennials, the interest is even stronger. One of the big trends in sustainable investing is data and the ability to understand how sustainable your investments are. By taking that information into account, investors can make better decisions for the long term. Sustainability is not about one number. It's about variables like water usage, data privacy, consumer trust, diversity, land use, and conservation. All types of investors are now considering this in their investment decisions. This is not niche. One in four dollars globally is following some form of sustainable investing. With sustainable investing at this scale, there's power to change the markets and have an impact on the issues investors care about most. I am Courtney Thompson, and we are Morgan Stanley. I'm Audrey Joy, Chief Sustainability Officer at Morgan Stanley. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panelists led by Lindsay, Linda, Lindsay Layton. Come on, come on, please. Thank you. wherever you'd like to sit. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. Um, I am so delighted to be in conversation this morning with, um, with some young folks and with, some, with a, wise, a wise folk. <laughs> um, there has been so much energy around these talks in Glasgow. Uh, uh, that are focused on youth. And we've seen them in the streets. Um, we hear the conversations uh, in the, the, uh, the Scottish uh, Exhibition Center where the talks are going on. There's been a, a tremendous discussion about generational divides over climate change. So um, I'm really looking forward to having a great conversation today. Um, we've got on my uh, on the end here, Jerome Foster from Washington D.C. Shout out to Washington D.C. He's the executive director of One Million of Us. Um, next to him, of course, is President Mary Robinson. She is the uh, chairman of the Elders, and sitting right here on my right is Evelyn Achem. She's a climate activist from Uganda. So the first thing I would really love to talk about is, and oh, I'm sorry, joining us by video. My apologies. We've got, uh, we've got Aya Chebi, and she's from Tunisia, although I think she might be in Glasgow. I'm not quite sure. Aya, are you with us? Yes. I Say can hello. Hear you. Hi. Good morning. Hi, um, Aya. Hi. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing? Good to see you. Um, the first thing I would really love to hear from the younger folks is uh, at what point when you were young, you know, growing up, did you realize 
the extent of the climate crisis and how did you become aware of it? And then how did you decide to engage in this issue? What was it that prompted you? Um, how did you get into this? So Jerome, you want to tell us your, your story? When did you, had you how old, you're, you're now 19, is that right? Yes, I'm 19 years old. Um, but I started when I was like really young, around like six or seven, just being involved in like having a connection with nature. <coughs> Sorry. You were six or seven when you first realized what was going on with the planet, is that right? Yeah, yeah, I was a science nerd. I learned more about astrophysics and like how like the outer space was like functioning, but I wanted to turn my interest back on my own planet and figure out how like humanity was operating within its own Earth. And I realized that it's not good, it's not productive, it's actually actively destroying our planet. And as a young person, it, it was a change in, in understanding because I thought that adults would be able to handle it. I thought that the world leaders would be, have the maturity enough to actually make solutions. But now we're here having to, to be at conferences and tell them why they need to make changes that should have been done when, before I was even born. And I think that's what organized and mobilized me to, to take action. But my story is not unique. It's like the story of a generation that over the years we became aware of the, the betrayal of our planet and are begging for world leaders to actually do something to save us. So. And Jerome, did you learn about this in school? Or you, how did you first get exposed to the, the climate change issue? Um, most of the time it was library books that I read. Or oftentimes it was in school books, but actually wasn't being taught it was just the subject of an English paper. It would be the fact that we'd take an SAT and maybe it would be like turtles would be something a part of that. And the, you have to write an essay about why turtles are dying. Or in kindergarten, you have to write pictures about like animals and not polar bears and on ice caps. And it's like, what is this? Why are people exposing this to me but not actually telling me the real cause and the real scope of the climate crisis? And I think that's how I first became aware of it. It just surrounded me. And Evelyn, can you tell us how you first, you, you told me something about you, you never were taught this in school, is that right? So, so tell us, how did you learn about the climate crisis? Um, so basically, in my country, climate change is not taught at all. Um, it's not taught at all, it's not reported in papers. Uh, when they report floods, they just say, um, this area flooded and schools were destroyed and children will not be able to go back to school. So as not, like, it's hard to understand and connect it to climate change. I only got to learn about this in 2019. After, um, and that is late 2019, after seeing my fellow activist, Vanessa Nakate, sure. um, do her individual protests on the streets of Kampala. I got so concerned because before she became an activist, we were friends and I, I was always curious about everything she did and I tried to like get involved. So when she started this, I got concerned and when I started doing research about what she was, what the, the signs on her placards, I realized this is something that we've been experiencing for a long time. I have seen this while growing up and I could not connect it to climate change. And I realized this is one of the biggest problems that we are facing as a community. It's one of the problems that is, that is affecting our country and it's, it's leading to poverty. So many, people are, so many people are suffering from poverty and this is connected to climate change in a way. So I saw an urgency to join the fight and that's how I became an activist. That's remarkable to me that it's only been two years since you learned about this, this issue. That, that's really, and look how far you've come on it and, and how active you've become. That's pretty amazing. Um, Aya, I wonder if you could tell us uh, when you first discovered the problem. How old were you and how did you get involved? I hope you can hear me well. Yes, I can yeah. hear you. Uh, when first of all, I want to say hi to everyone in Glasgow. Uh, I'm, I'm calling in from Tunis and I'm very proud of all the young activists out there I've been following and uh, this is a badass generation because they are there doing the work. They're calling out the leaders, they're mobilizing in and outside the room so I'm, I'm very very much proud of the young activists. Um, so your question how or when I was aware of the climate crisis but I actually refuse to call it <laughs> A climate crisis. We, we keep saying the refugee crisis, the migration crisis, the climate 
a crisis, but to me it's a crisis of leadership. And I became aware of my exclusion from leadership at a very, very young age, whether because of my gender or my age. And I think growing up, all these issues became intersectional to me, uh, whether it's climate, whether it's inequality, whether it's human rights. So my cause really became justice. Um, before I got my period, when I was nine years old, I got subjected to some of the harmful practices or ritual that claim to protect your virginity. And so I've seen how power dynamic plays uh, in the family uh, you know, and how patriarchy plays in the family. And then you grow up, you go to school, and you see the society and how power dynamics play. And then you go into activism and then you go into politics. And every single day, I am more convinced that the crisis is of leadership. It's a crisis of decision making. It's a crisis of management. But we keep throwing this crisis to other things, saying that, oh, we need to fix something outside. It's not outside. It's within us. These are decisions that have to be taken at a national level by individuals who are responsible for taking these decisions. So I think. Um, uh, we need to go into that direction of starting to, to talk about the leadership itself that excludes even the young activists out there, you know, by, um, you know, bringing them to speak at conferences, but at the end of the day, in the closed rooms where deals are made, how many young activists are on the table? We need to start asking these questions. Well, I think that's a very interesting point. It's something that I've heard throughout this week. Um, this, this, the demands of, of young leaders um, saying, you know, the older generations are not leading, get out of the way. We need to, to, to push forward and have a seat at the table. And I wonder, uh, President Robinson, when you're, when you're hearing all this discussion about you know, anger from young activists saying that the older generations have failed to, 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 to respond to this problem, they need to move aside, what, what, what is your response to that? Well, first of all, you can call me Mary, and then I'll feel a bit younger, you know, around the table. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I liked the point that I was making because I've been making that point. Yeah, it's the leaders here today on their watch who are between us and a, a very dismal future, if not catastrophic, because we're on course for 2.4 degrees Celsius, according to Climate Action Tracker. So. It is a leadership issue. I, I very much agree with Aya, and I almost identify with what she was saying because I didn't think about climate because it wasn't an issue for me growing up in Ireland way, way back in the last century. But I did think about justice and human rights. I had four brothers and they influenced me a lot and I used my elbows and I was fighting justice issues at that stage. And then much, much later came to understand climate. And I think, uh, I think it's important to have this intergenerational conversation, but it shouldn't be always as it's tending to be seen between elders like me and very young because they're very smart and bright. It's a lovely conversation. Um, the elders like to have this intergeneration. We have blogs, you, you know, we've all done blogs on our website. Um, but actually, we need a conversation with the 30 to 60 year olds who are the power brokers in our world. You know, they need to be hearing and taking on board and influenced by um, the uh, you know, the, the young climate activists, um, because um, it, they're the ones that have the decision-making power. I wonder, um, Mary, <laughs> when you look at, at uh, and you hear from these younger leaders, uh, if you see yourself at all in them, um, and I, I wonder about the young Mary Robinson, if you could have a conversation with her based on all of your wisdom and your knowledge from your career in you know, the public sphere, what advice would you, would you give her? What would that conversation um, say? Well, I, I do sort of sometimes reflect that when I was growing up, the intergenerational relationship was different. I had a beloved grandfather who was a lawyer who had to retire quite early um, and who was telling me about the cases of the, being for the tenant against the landlord, the things that were, had been happening in Ireland at the time, fighting for justice, basically, and he, he influenced me greatly. But I didn't say a word. I, I was there to listen. You know, mm. that's the difference. Mm. Whereas now, young people are, first of all, they're so smart, they're digitally connected, and actually, um, they speak in very, uh, you know, very connected terms. Um, they, they use the word love. Um, they, they understand those who are more affected. And, and I think that is, you know, it's really important. I think we have a, a younger generation 
because of all the inju injustices, and I agree with Aya about the intersectionality of you know, the racial injustice, gender injustice, poverty injustice, injustice of people with disability, um, you know, finding it even harder to have access, etc. Um, uh, th th there's a, there's a, uh, I hope we will be influenced you know, by this sense of an engagement of young people who also are engaged with each other and showing solidarity. It's so badly needed because it's not there at the top. Um, Lindsay, yes. if I may, because you asked Mama Mary if she sees herself in us, but uh, I want to say that we see ourselves in her because I saw uh, yesterday uh, an interview she did and she got really emotional uh, about the issue and that's how I want to be. I want to continue to care because when we get into power or when we get into positions and, and that's really um, the, the danger of a lot of young people who are going into these spaces to uh, become products of these systems. Mm. Uh, and when we get into the system and, and a lot of the leaders we had hope in, we, we cheered for, they were role models for us, but when you get into power, things change. And, and seeing uh, Mama Mary, uh, you know, consistency and commitment and care about the issues uh, until now and giving her time and effort and, 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 and all, that's how I want to be. That's who I want to be when I grow up as well. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's a long journey. It's called the struggle, right? And, and I think in the intergenerational question, I think uh, that's why it's hard to have a generational conversation because in the women movement and in any other movement, it's all the generations together coming for a cause. But the intergenerational is very difficult because every generation comes with a new vision, with new aspirations, with... Uh, you know, now the technology, even the generation under me, I'm a millennial, but you know, my cousin and my nephews, that's another word that I have to get into. Um, and I think what we need to be discussing right now is that us as a millennials, uh, you know, um, connecting with the next generation, we shouldn't make the same mistakes that we did with previous generation, that disconnection. Um, because I think with our innovation and with the elders' wisdom, we can do something. Um, and we need to get out of this dichotomy of us versus them. Uh, and that's why I, I call always for intergenerational co-leadership. It's not about getting all the, you know, quote-unquote bad guys out. It's actually to co-lead with them so we can transform the system from within, so we can be able to, on a long term, um, really radically change uh, the institutions. Uh, I think all of the experiences are important, and I, I speak of a context in Africa where the average age of African leaders is 64, and the average age of the population is almost 20. We have 40 years of generation gap, which is a, gener which is a gap in understanding the problem, in understanding the solution, even communicating and listening to each other. And, in, and uh, this continent will double. Half of the world will be African by the end of this century. So if we don't deal with this generation gap, it's going to be the crisis itself. So I think this conversation is, is extremely important. Thank you so much for that. I, I, think, I think you raised some excellent points. And I was, uh, as you were speaking, I was thinking of Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who last week remarked that you know, the median age of the world leaders who were here in Glasgow was over 60. Um, meanwhile, the people in the streets who were at the barricades were very young. And um, so my question is, how do you infiltrate that, um, that power structure? How do young people get um, a voice and get a seat at the table? So many uh, folks who are in their teens and early 20s are turned off by politics. Right? They think it's, you know, blah, 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 compromise. They're, they're not interested in, in the political system. So what's the answer? What do you think? Jerome, how do, how, do, how do you convince your peers to run for office or, you know, get involved in the system? Absolutely. That was the question that I had in around 2019 when we organized after September 2019 and got like 7 million young people in the streets. It was like, how do we take this energy that's in this movement and directly translated into votes at the ballot box in November of 2020. And I started an organization called One Million of Us, which worked solely on that, which to get one million young people to Im directly impact politics. And what I realized is that young people aren't turned out by climate change. They aren't just ignoring it. They're just tired of the bickering and partisan points and 
conversations that don't get anywhere, they're looking for value-based arguments. They're looking for actual dialogue around what can we do to stop these issues and not just say, what marginal improvement can we make in the next 20 years that might save our future if we do something? It's like that's not what empowers people. When I organized in community and we had hundreds of young people go out in, in all across the United States and try to get people to vote, the biggest thing that they voted for was climate action and racial justice. And they voted because of that. It wasn't because they're a Democrat or Republican. They didn't care about either color. They cared about what can we do with this vote? What is the power of our vote? And I think that's how young people infiltrate systems is by using the power of money or using the power of votes. Young people don't have money. We're most of the time either in high school or college, but we have massive amounts of votes. We have massive amounts of political power if we have the, 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 the energy to do it. And I think that's really what has to happen in 2022, 2024, in any international election is for us to continue to show up is because only when young people showed up in the US, we made up 20% of every ballot cast in the United States in the 2020 election, Biden then elected me to, to represent youth. Like I'm the only young person in the White House right now. Everyone else is, is a full, fully adult. And that's because of young people that mobilize all across the country. And we need more of that. We need young people to be in these conversations because what happens is it enriches our solutions. It talks about longevity. It talks about how do we have solutions that aren't just thinking about re-election, but thinking about a value base that allows us to have more system-rooted conversations, like how do we decolonize our economic system? How do we de um, race, racial, racially like give out funding? Because right now, in, in the White House, we're having so many conversations around how do we give funding to frontline communities and not have racism swindle away that money? because over the past 10 years, that's been a big issue. Like those are the conversations young people are not scared to have. Those are the conversations we want to start. And that's why young people need to be in these tables and that's how we infiltrate and make our movement more powerful. But how do you get, you know, people your age who are concerned with all sorts of other things and, not, and, and really tuned out of politics, how do you get them to show up, to vote, to engage? What, how do you do it? What we did is we met them where they are on social media. Like social media is a biomember of nature. Like we can connect anywhere at any time and we're able to see and be interconnected with each other. And from us, we just reached out to them. We did a campaign called Prom at the Polls because because of the pandemic, we weren't able to have a prom. So we said prom is a, is a celebration of adulthood and graduating into your, uh, to being a fully grown citizen. Why not link that to the power of voting and being an adult and being an active citizen? And by people going in their prom dresses and prom suits to the ballot box, we had a movement of people that just <laughs> did that. And that was the major thing that, that, drew, that drew us to get 1.2 million young people to swing the election and get Democrats in office all across the country. Prom to the polls, I like that. Evelyn, do you have thoughts about you know, how to engage people your age in the political system? Um, I, I first of all want to um, agree with what Jerome just said. Um, I'm so impressed by <laughs> and inspired by how you got there and how you mobilize the young people. And I agree with him saying that um, the young generation are tired of, of, of seeing like the wrong decisions being made every day and these decisions are affecting them every day because they are like they're still planning for a very long future ahead of them and most of the decisions are not really like favoring them so they are tired of sitting back and watching people dying and watching um, children dropping out of school because again there are quite a number of, of things that are connected to them, if I may say. Like when you talk of school, when you talk of um, hospitals being destroyed, when you talk of, yeah, the rest are, are also affecting the older generation. But again, the older generation have the power to make the decisions because like he said, uh, most decision making rooms are full of they have mostly the older generation and the young people are not there. So they have the power to make that decision. So again, this goes back to young people being tired of the decisions that are being made that are very wrong, that are not, um, that are not favoring them, that are destroying their environment, that are destroying their future. 
and they have to use everything they have. They have to go out of their way to, to create platforms for them to speak up, for them to be heard. Like he talked of social media. Uh, yeah, social media works so much because so many people today are so much on social media, going to the streets like the way we protested on Thursday and Friday because we were not given platform in the negotiation rooms. So we have to go on the streets and just speak up. We have to create our platforms and get our voices to be heard. So yeah, these are all ways that young people are going out there to speak up for themselves. But Evelyn, you know, there are different ways of influencing. I mean, I was impressed. I mean, you got your degree in land management. What was it? Land, land economy. Land economy. Yes. And now you're in your Ministry of Land yes. in, um, uh, in Uganda. Yes. Um, so you're influencing policy. Yes. Um, I mean, do you feel that you're being effective in doing that? Um, in my country, maybe uh, when it comes to climate, the climate action and climate change. So many people don't want to hear about this. Yeah. But I feel like after attending this COP, because we had government officials attending the, 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 the climate summit as well, I feel like after attending this COP, I have created a, a quite a, an influence on people Good. because people are seeing how serious this is. And it's been in papers, it's been on TV, it's yeah. been everywhere because recently, I got a text from my boss like asking me about updates from the <laughs> summit. So I feel like after this summit, there's an impact. Good. Yeah. yeah. I, I wonder if you have thoughts about how to uh, get young, younger folks engaged in political systems. I do. And I think, um, I think we need to start approaching this differently because we always think about um, young people fighting for participation, young people fighting for their voice, young people, you know, uh, or young people attracting other young people, mobilizing other young people to be uh, engaged. I think we, we, we should start talking about the leadership actually attracting young people to be in decision making because you need us at the end of the day. If you want to have legacy, if you want to have sustainability, if you want to have continuity, even decisions made now that will have impact in the future, I think we need to start um, approaching also as not like only youth spaces and then decision making spaces that is dominated by old men. It should be about a whole of society conversation and how to engage young people. Um, and I think young people are already engaged. It's not about raising their awareness uh, because they're very much aware they um, very much great at mobilization. I was part of the revolution in my country in 2011 in Tunisia, which inspired, you know, tons of revolutions after that. So just recently, movements in Nigeria, and Namibia, and Sudan, and Algeria, all across the continent and all across the world. So we actually master the tool of mobilization. That's not our issue. Our issue is when decisions are made, when it's about our future, when it affects us first, we have to be part of that decision making. We have to occupy the leadership space in masses, just like we occupy the streets in masses. Um, and I think also we need to move the conversation from, because I hear a lot of this raising awareness about climate issues. We need to start raising consciousness. Um, people want to deal with issues with dignity. That's like human dignity is the essence of it. The, the slogan we used in Tunisia's revolution was Jobs, freedom, dignity. This was a slogan led by young people who are 23, 22 years old, 10 years ago. After 10 years ago, you see Sudan last year raising the same slogan. Mm. So this is essentially about consciousness. So it's not enough about voting or going to a conference or uh, being aware of the issue. Now it needs a whole of society consciousness. At the heart of it, understanding that engaging youth, having youth in leadership, attracting youth to politics and to decision-making spaces will benefit everyone because that is the future. Could I just build on what I yes, was saying with, with a specific example? Um, you know, uh, I was shocked and I think a number of us were shocked at the conference in Copenhagen, how 
male and technical and scientific it was. So the following year, a number of women got together. Uh, Patricia Espinosa, who was the foreign minister of Mexico at the time. Um, 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 anyway, the, the three women who had been president of COPS and formed a network, and my small foundation was kind of the secretariat of that network, of women leaders on gender and climate. And we went to Durban and we planned to have a decision in Doha, which we got on more balance, et cetera. And then we helped with the gender action plan. But to Aya's point, we realized the members of this network included ministers for uh, environment, energy, and some foreign ministers. And uh, they had the power to decide who would be in the delegations. So they started to include grassroots women, indigenous women, and young women in the delegations with delegates' badges which made they were at the table. And that made a huge difference at Paris and after Paris. And now it's much more common. Um, it's not enough. But the point is, unless those in at the table make room for young people to be at the table, it's not going to work. I agree with Aya. So are, are you saying, Mary, that women leaders are more inclusive or, or more sensitive to who is missing? Is that I think there is more of a tendency. I think more women leaders of my age and even a little bit younger are realizing we need to give more space so that the voices um, of young leaders will be there. I mean, um, I remember, uh, you know, I'm chair of the elders, as you know, and I remember Kofi Annan over and over again saying, you are never too young to lead, you are never too old to learn. And oh, I, I love, love that. that line, never <laughs> too young to lead, never too old to learn. And if we, as I was saying, can co-decide with the different generations properly represented, we'll get better decisions. We'll also get better decisions if there's gender balance. Wow, I, lo I love that phrase. You're never <laughs> too young to lead, never too old to learn. That's pretty good. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about, because I was so struck uh, when, you, when you told me, Evelyn, that you'd only learned about the climate crisis two years ago, um, education. Um, what we're teaching kids in schools around the planet regarding climate, the crisis. Um, there is a school of thought that it is such a terrifying specter, you know, what we're, what we're facing, that, that some people want to insulate kids. They don't, you know, want them to know about this. Climate anxiety is real. Um, you know, there are parents and teachers who think that it's too much to lay on the shoulders of young children. Um, what do you think about that? How should we be teaching? How should schools, how should families, parents, what should, the, what should be the communication around um, the climate situation? What do you think? What, what would you have benefited from? Um, yes, I, I know climate, climate anxiety is real, but this is the problem we are facing today. This is the reality we are seeing today. These are the disasters we are seeing today. So I feel like this is, this is something compulsory for a child to learn, but you find a more calm way to explain to a child. You don't have to bring it in form of disasters. You could just bring it in form of um, sustainable living in the future or um, in form of like taking care of the environment. Yeah, because this is real, like climate change is real, it's everywhere. But of course, in some communities, teaching it the harder way is not like so, like it will bring, it will not bring that kind of anxiety. It will just maybe make the kids act so fast. Like personally, I've been going to schools in Uganda. I've been going to schools and talking to, to children about climate change and I tell them about the rising temperatures and these temperatures are drying up crops and this is causing people like to stay hungry and not have food to eat and the response from the kids has been like very good and they're asking so many questions and they're ready to learn and ready to take this information back to their parents. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it depends on the, the, the nation as well and the kind of um, culture in that nation. In some nations, children are hard enough to take in some kind of information. Then in some nations, they are a bit sensitive to that. So let me talk about maybe the 
the, the global north or the white nations. I think uh, the children are a bit sensitive, so they need to find ways of bringing it like in a more calm way to help them understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I believe. And yeah. if I could just give another example to yeah. build on what Evelyn was saying. Um, in Ireland now, um, at primary school and increasingly at secondary school, the sustainable development goals are becoming part of the curriculum. You know, I wear this badge. It's a, it's a, it's a larger badge than the UN one. I lost my UN one. <laughs> it's the only badge of the UN I've ever liked because it goes with everything, you know. But, um, uh, you know, and, and in universities, you have sustainable development goal hubs and, you know, and you're, it becomes a centre for research at university, centering around, because the sustainable development goals, you know, they include goal 13 on climate action, but also, you know, oceans, um, production and consumption, um, education itself, health. You know, it's, it's a very holistic approach. I mean, people at, at the time, I was the special envoy of the Secretary General um, before Paris during that year, and in September, 193 countries agreed this 2030 agenda and its 17 sustainable development goals. And people said, people won't remember the 17, that's too much. But actually, it shows the kind of complexity of bringing in the oceans and biodiversity and nature, etc., as well as climate. And, and, and therefore, it's a very good teaching tool. And it's less kind of um, gloom and doom than focus on climate at this stage when we're not doing enough can be for young people. So I think the sustainable development goals should be a curriculum for every school in the world and, you know, and for um, universities and research, etc. Jerome, do you have thoughts about this? Yeah, I think that when it comes to climate education, we have to have a discussion around what do we teach kids? Because for us, we were born or we woke up in a world that's in the process of dying. And having that be your everyday reality, it it's kind of like an act of striking, just being hopeful and being joyful in the world. That, that's, that's already a lot to handle. And I think going to school and learning about climate has to happen, but we have to talk about justice and see climate not as just an academic dilemma, but actually as a social and cultural problem that we have to embrace. And I think teaching kids about recycling, teaching kids about how to live sustainably in every part of school, not just being its own core subject, but actually being how a school functions on a day-to-day -day basis, could strengthen how it's taught. I think also climate education just oftentimes just touch the surface. Like we talk about issues, but we don't delve deep into why we're having these conversations about climate. Like what is the climate crisis really? It's, it's a continuation of the industrial revolution. It's a continuation of a colonial and extractivist mindset. It's, there's an immediate through line when we talk about climate change and colonialism. It's the same idea of extracting from communities, but now it's extraction of resources and of, of, of nature. And that's how we have to frame climate education, is talking about the deeper issues and talking about why we're having to, to redefine our economic system and, and retransform our political system to be in line and be in solidarity with nature and not just try to ex extract as much as we can from it for as much capital profit as possible. We have to make sure we, that young people understand that we have to have a circular economy and that everything that we live, everything in this next decade and everything in our timeline in the future must not just be just thinking about how do we make small changes, but actually embody joy and embody optimism and embody what we want our future to look like on Mother. Um, I would like to add on Evelyn. something else. Yeah. Um, we could also bring it in this way of solutions, teaching the children mm -hmm. solutions. Like in Uganda, we have, a pro we have a project that's running. It's called Vash Green Schools, installation of solar panels, solar lighting and, and eco-friendly stoves in school. So as the, the, as the solar stoves are installed in schools, of course, you explain to the children why you are doing this. This is one of the solutions to sustainable living. This is one of the solution to reduce on the impacts of climate change. And that way, you're bringing it in a, in a calmer way to explain to them what climate change is. So maybe we could also start with the solutions to. So sort of emphasizing empowerment and you yeah. know, that, that you know, there, there are ways out of this. Um, I, I wonder if you have anything that you want to add to that. Yeah, probably just adding on the last point that I absolutely agree. I think our education should produce change makers who think of solutions rather than 
and employed graduates. Uh, I, I organized a workshop last weekend and the rate of unemployment of Tunisian graduates, we have the highest, uh, you know, uh, high university graduates, about over 90%, but we have 20% unemployment and in many areas about 50 to 60%. So uh, uh, I absolutely agree uh, on the last point, but to go back to education, I think what I am missing from 21st century education, because I think we're dealing with 21st century problems with 20th century education, is, um, is identity. Because identity teaches you your connection to your environment, your connection to the land, to earth, your connection to your culture, your connection to your ancestors. And we don't have that in our education. We, as a Tunisian, I graduate completely lost in my identity. Am I African, am I Mediterranean, am I Maghrebian? You know, which land I come from, who are our indigenous people? Education, as my brother said, starts from colonization. Yeah. And I think what is important for Africa as well is to teach our pre-colonial knowledge and wisdom because everyone now talk, talks about the trendy organic and gluten-free and all these things that existed in Africa way long. People, what, if that was the norm. That was not something we have to change to become. That was the lives of my grandmother and that's why also they you know, uh, continue to, to, to produce sustainability in our villages when we go back. And then you know, we go now to urban areas and we see completely different life. So I think our education system, unless it addresses the identity issue, an identity issue now has to become global because we are global citizens now. We don't have borders. Our, my generation wants a borderless world, and that's why we migrated online, because that allows us that imagination of the world. And our education doesn't provide that. We're still in boxes of what we are taught, and we, we still study geography as the periphery, as Africa and Europe as the center. So how do you expect someone to graduate at 21 and be able to focus on solutions? Someone to graduate 21 or 20 will focus on getting a job <laughs> and not really, you know, um, invest in, uh, in these global issues. And then, as I said, the second thing is really to start thinking about, as Africa, our Pan-African uh, uh, education that teaches us our wisdom and knowledge that can also serve the world and also all indigenous populations around the world that it need to be taught so it can, it can save us. Maybe we are a bit, uh, you know, we, thought, we talk about the future, the future of work, the future solution, the innovation, but maybe there is something in the past that we haven't learned from yet. That's an excellent point. I know that we are, uh, we are running down the clock and I wanted to open it up to see if we had any questions from the audience. Um, if anyone has, a, please raise your hand. The woman in the third row. Hi. Hi, my name is Johanna Suleta. I was born in Colombia and I'm also a British citizen. And uh, I wonder, well, I was very touched on your question on, of identity. Uh, how are you regularly and particularly in this talk regarding passing the torch, the older generation and the new generation, how are you emulating this in your communities on daily basis or on a continuous basis? And I'd like to know how are you applying that actively uh, from each of you? Thank you very much. Maybe start with Aya. Uh, uh, oh, Aya? Yes. Do you have a response to that? Yeah, if I, if I understood uh, the question well, so there are two, two things. Uh, one is the, the community and as you said, the everyday life and I think the ideal scenario of that is to sit with Mama Mary for hours and just <laughs> listen to her. Um, and Mama Mary exists in many of our communities and just to take the time and sit and learn and listen from both, you know, it's an intergenerational learning. And I think the, the second part is the policy. And when I was envoy of the African Union on youth, I, the first thing I did, I organized 100 intergenerational dialogues at the highest level of decision making. Basically bringing commissioners, bringing ministers, bringing decision makers to sit down with the most radical youth who otherwise won't sit down and listen to and who the young people themselves wouldn't like to sit with 
those decision makers because they critique them all day long and they complain about them. But that's where it starts. It starts with the communication. Um, uh, again, in Africa, we have the generation that fought for the liberation, the generation that brought independence, so the 60s. And then we have the generation that built the African nation, so the 80s and 90s. And then we have the current generation now subjected to all these forms of inequality and inheriting all the issues of the past 60 years. And all these three are not talking to each other. So I think it's a continuous work from the community, from the family, uh, from the school, from the workspace, to make every space, to the highest level, to make every space intergenerational. And that goes both sides. So if you are in a room where there is no young people, you have to bring the youth in. But if you are in a room where it's a youth space, you have to bring the elders in. And I think that's where we're gonna start seeing this shift day after day, because now we can communicate, now we understand each other's issues, now you know that when we don't go to vote, it's not because we're not conscious citizens, it's because we're making a statement. There is no one to vote for, no one represent us. That's when you, you will start understanding the dynamics of the youth movement. And that's when we can also understand where the elders you know, come from and where they have been able to achieve the past 60 years and where they, they say they failed and where they say don't do like us and don't do our mistakes. And I think that is an ongoing um, platform that the elders, the organization the elders is doing that we have been doing at the African Union, that now we are launching the African uh, Intergenerational Forum with also uh, many of the elders like Mama Grasha, Michelle and all of these elders who are champions of youth. And we need those allies. So what I would also say to young people, whoever elders you have, who are the likes of Mama Mary and Mama Grasha, Michelle, and all these amazing elders who now dedicate their lives to champion young people cause, to open space to young people, to go into a room of decision making and require that they bring youth in this space. Those are the elders we need to work with because without doing that, we cannot just do it on the street, guys. And it's not enough to do it on the street. We need our allies, we need our allies to get into those decision-making tables. I think that is an excellent thought on which to, to end. I'm sorry we've, we've run down the, the clock here, um, but I want to thank everybody, Aya, Jerome, Mary, Evelyn, and all of you for, for coming in and spending some time with us this morning to talk about this really interesting issue. Thanks, everyone. Thank